64 cores of pure, unadulterated madness. It's madness, I tell you, madness. I feel a lot like Dr. Frankenstein must have felt. It's alive, alive. But also, what do I know? I mean, it's not easy to find workloads where you could really use 64 cores. I mean, that's not a garden variety workload. That's not a garden variety really anything. I mean, that's, uh, it's hard to find something that'll use 64 cores and use it properly. Now I did some other videos on this and how the benchmarks can be misleading. The 64 core is better in some ways than the benchmarks will show. And the benchmarks can also be misleading for what you can expect to get or what you can expect for your particular thing that you're doing. So we get a lot of questions like compiling. So take for example, compile time. Uh, the Linux kernel, it's about 20 seconds from the 24 core all the way up to the 64 core monster. 20 seconds, it's, it's not really a lot different. It's a few seconds different, but it's not really a lot different across all the different CPUs. Now, Linus Torvalds recently accepted a patch to the Linux kernel that's gonna speed things up even more because they identified a bottleneck in the Linux kernel, but for people doing typical development with the kernel, the thing that they're interested in is not really what the Linux kernel compile benchmark is doing. It's not really super real world in that regard. The type of compiling that say a Linux kernel developer is doing um, is different because a lot of things are cached and so it won't be super fast. The benchmark really in the real world is closest to regression testing or maybe uh, using git bisect, well a special version of git bisect to run a test across a bunch of different versions from a program's commit history looking for a previously unknown bug. So it's not, it's a little bit edge case. It's a little bit more edge case than real world scenario. But today, today we got something special. We're gonna look at the Unreal Engine, an Unreal Engine game, specifically Path of Titans, the game. Not just that though, also open embedded, Yocto Linux, Qt5, Clang Rust, and about 10,000 other packages for cross-compiling Linux. They might be asking, what does Unreal have to do with cross-compiling Linux? Well, first up, Unreal, like Adobe Premiere, when we're talking about benchmarking, you know, every different Unreal project is gonna behave differently, so the benchmark results are gonna be different, just like with the Adobe Premiere projects and multimedia and, you know, Threadripper's a monster there. And yeah, Path of Titans, it's early access, they did a, an Indiegogo. Uh, it's an MMO dinosaur survival game, but they gave me access to their game. They just let me loose in the engine room with, with their game. Over 40 gigabytes of assets, code, you know, you name it. Now, with just some fine tuning, spoiler alert, I got the build time down to about 20 minutes, including packing assets. Now the short version is that the 64 core can speed up the dev job there by about 40% over the 32 core. And with Unreal, you could get a target, you know, of a couple of different kinds of builds, not just the one build, for different editions of the game. So like when you have a major code change, you rebuild everything, you're gonna rebuild the demo, the regular version, maybe there's a platinum version, maybe there's other different versions. Now with the 32 core, you can do that same job in about 27 minutes, so it's a little slower. And the 24 core can do it in around 35 minutes. And again, your IO matters, your memory matters, a lot of other variables go into that. So with a 64 core setup, that means every dev needs a 64 core workstation, right? No, uh, you really, uh, you really don't need, even with this test, not every single developer needs a 64 core. I mean, you do need a lot of IO, and you need an IO that can handle a lot of random operations. A lot of the new PCIe 4 SSDs are not optimized for the server, they're optimized for single user workloads. But the 64 core is so massively parallel that you're actually better off with SSDs that can handle more, what is more typically referred to as a multi-user workload, even though it's not necessarily multi-user. So SSDs like our fancy Intel P4500s, they're better. Now, in uh, you know, for compiles and that kind of thing. Now, the other limitation is 256 gig memory limit. That was part of my exploring these two projects. And yeah, I mean, the big boy 64 core systems now are limited to 256 gigabytes of RAM, but our Unreal peak memory load was only about 112 gigabytes. So well under the 256 gig limit. It even worked fine with 64 gigabytes, but uh, overall was about 5% slower 
give or take, and we, we just hit swap. So 256 gigs of memory for Path of Titans for Unreal, even with 64 cores on the compile, wasn't needed. It was nice to have, but it wasn't needed. So enter Yocto, Yocto Linux and cross compiling. Now suppose you're the dev team of a global multinational corporation, the likes of which that you cannot name or disclose. Now suppose you consult with the, uh, the dev team about their projects and the development and everything that goes into that. And suppose, hypothetically, of course, completely hypothetically, that uh, those that dev team needs to target you know a half a dozen different CPU architectures, and they develop on one unified Linux platform, you know, Yocto Linux and Open Embedded. That same embedded system that I have experience with from the Intel Edison days, those, those guys were canned before their time, I'm so sorry. The Edison really was a good project, Intel just mishandled it, I'm sorry. So. I can and I have compiled Yocto Linux to run on a crock pot. And the 64 core does actually make that faster. How much faster does the 64 core, 64 thread, 128 thread, 64 core thread ripper do with this? Well, with this build, with this scenario, it's about two hours and change, a little less than two hours. Uh, depending on some, some options with the 64 core. The 32 core, it's about two hours and 49 minutes. Open embedded, you know, it also does a lot of caching to speed build time. So it's a little bit like the kernel. Real world, you very rarely have to do like that full recompile. But with this one, I've got a GitHub repo set up. So if you want, you can connect to, you know, github.com slash level one Wendell and clone this project and run the scripts. And if you follow the instructions and you send me a pull request, I'll add information about the results from your system to the build, as long as the build actually completes. And to complete the build, you're gonna need at least 128 gigs of memory and lots of swap. And if you look right now, you'll see that there's older systems that uh, Martin uh, Jansa, I think, I hope, hopefully I got your name right, uh, did some testing. And <laughs> V3 and V4, uh, Xeon systems, they're junk. I mean, throw that, throw it away, throw that junk away. It's an antique. I mean, <laughs> it's like five hours, seven hours. 32 core Threadripper, a plucky little $2,000 CPU can do it in less than three hours. That's crazy. So the 64 core is a monster CPU and the same caveat kind of applies here as it does for game dev. You need fast storage. And for the 128 gig memory test, I use Optane and it did help. It's the U.2 Optane in my wheelie boy Fractal Define 7. Oh, it's nice. This job is way too big for 64 gigs of memory. Doesn't even complete properly. Uh, 128 gigs is still a little small for this. I mean, we used over 60 gigs of swap on the Optane, worst case scenario, and that's on the 32 core system where we're not running that many uh, make jobs in parallel. This is the only dev job that I could find from, I tried probably about 11 or 12 different build jobs where I was running massively parallel operations. And this is about the only one that I could find that would actually bump up against the 32 gig, I mean the uh, 256 gig limit of the 64 core Threadripper, or the Threadripper 3000 family, I should say. So I hit 218 gigabytes at peak with so many parallel compile tasks, which that's a little too close for comfort. Um, you can run, I mean, of course, with the Open Embedded project, you can run fewer jobs in parallel. You still benefit a little bit with the 64 core because you've doub doubled your amount of cache. And build jobs and compile jobs generally like having a lot of cache. Now, if we're talking about you know, day job programming, I feel like I have to point this out because somebody's gonna hop in here and be like, uh, psh, I run Node.js, I need the 64 core. And it's like, no, no. There's not a lot of, for, for most day job type programmers, there's not really a lot of difference between like the Ryzen 5 3600 and a 3950 and Threadripper. And the reason for that is because most of those dev jobs, they're not super multi-threaded. The, the jobs that we're talking about here for development are the exceptions. For Path of Titans, the game, we also aren't just building the game, potentially. We're also building many different languages, many different versions of the game, the demo version, regular version, like I mentioned before, premium version. It's even possible to target multiple platforms. So things like Linux, Windows, Mac. If you really go nuts with the Unreal Engine, you could also do mobile platforms and other platforms. And so you're building all of those different things at once when you've got a major change, depending on what you're doing with your game. But after the build is done, 
that's only like the build itself is really only half the story. You also have this other thing called a continuous integration and development workflow or development system. And all of a sudden, as soon as that build is done, you fired up a bunch of virtual machines and you start testing the compiled product and doing quality assurance in, in a completely automated way. So you might record a script where you go through the, the introductory parts of the game or the character creation part of the game or something like that. The robots can test that and that's gonna run on the same machine or a different set of machines. And so this CI, CD stuff, that's what it's called, continuous integration, continuous development. Just as soon as that gets involved, uh, that Ryzen 5 3600 for your day job programmer, that is completely out the window. That is not gonna cut it when you start doing some of your own QA and QC tasks. And depending on what your workflow is, when you do the game, you might do the, you might ask the build server to do the build and they'll send you the build and you start running some of the basic QA stuff on your machine and then eventually, you know, you work your way up the, the QA hierarchy. Oh. And for Open Embedded, it's kind of the same story. It's a little easier even in game development because we got Yocto Linux on toasters and rice cookers and you know bedpans and you know just whatever. The story doesn't end at the compile there either. You you got to boot up Virtual Bedpan 1.0 and run through your integration tests to make sure that the change that you've made to the operating system or Chrome or libc or whatever doesn't uh, cause the the bedpan to blue screen or or you know just not operate correctly. I mean the Internet of Things is is uh, one of the most boring dystopias ever. And getting through that, that fresh build is uh, just half of the story. But the faster you can get through the fresh build, the faster you can move on to those integration tests and, and other sorts of tests. And so anyway, this has been an incredible opportunity for me to share with you guys some real world insight into both a real world Unreal Engine game that's on Indiegogo and doing pretty well on Indiegogo from what I understand, but also the world of cross compiled software platform development, similar to how you know, embedded systems are developed and that kind of thing, because you got to believe that the bedpan's probably still running MIPS, and then we've got ARM in the mix, and then maybe we've got like ARM V8, and there's probably a half a dozen other platforms and x86, and oh, it just turns into a mess. Let's just build and test all of that all at once, deploy it, because you don't want to, <laughs> like with the Intel Edison, even though it's x86, you don't want to be compiling an Intel Edison. It would take seven years. You want to compile on another system and send it over there, and so that's, that's part of it. And then when you send it over there and you start doing the testing and, and that kind of thing, the you know, the super powerful system is supervising what's happening on the other system, or it's just doing it in a fully simulated environment. So the 64 core does have its uses. These are niche use cases. And like I say, you know, just the day job developer, just the massive cache of the Ryzen 5 3600 is, is, is generally gonna run circles around pretty much everything else. It's just these really monstrous edge case projects where you might run into something. And so like with the 64 core, not every developer needs that necessarily. Your team lead or your QA or your, your, your integration, whoever's responsible, whoever's responsible for those scrum meetings, you know, they might have the 64 core system um, to help run all of the tests from the team. But by and large, that's not something that everybody needs, especially when you compare it to the cost of like the 24 core and you get, you know, the 24 core is a not insignificant high percentage of the performance overall versus the 64 core for a lot of those common developer workloads. But I thought this was fascinating. So I'm rambling. I'm Wendell, this is level one. If you enjoyed this video, you know, share it. Updo it, whatever. If I did a terrible job, you can always down do it. But 64 cars! All right, I'm signing out. I'll see you later.